want to introduce oh, yeah, me? Sure. Okay, so one of the, uh, the things that Miniconcert LCA meant to, uh, is meant to do um, is encourage people who haven't presented at free software conferences before to get up and do just that. Uh, our next presenter is a functional programming geek from who's recently finished his Bachelor of IT at QUT. Yep. So he's also um, a local presenter, which is uh, rather good. Uh, please welcome Brian McKenna speaking about F Sharp. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Uh, well, that come on. All right. Um, I, yeah, I just finished from QUT and I'm about to move down to Sydney to work for an Australian company called Atlassian. Um, so check them out if, um, if you're into Australian IT. Is that better? Good. Um, all right, so I'll just get straight into the talk because we don't have much time. Um, so why am I talking about this now? Well, f -sharp was first released around 2002. So it's kind of getting old, like according to programming language history anyway. So why would I be talking about it in 2011? Well, the old versions of F Sharp up until November were released under this thing called the Microsoft Research Edge Source License Agreement. So that was not an open source license. And it was, you could download the source code, you could compile it on Windows maybe, and it just wasn't, but you weren't allowed to distribute your changes or anything. It was only for personal use. Um, November 2010, they released under the Apache license. So now it's completely open source. You can download it and redistribute it everywhere. And you can make your own version of F-sharp. So why would you look into F-sharp? Well, it runs on the .NET platform, so that means it's portable. You can compile something on Windows, have it run on Linux, have it run on Mac, same binary format, and it runs on all three operating systems. Uh, it's also language independent, so you can use F, you can use F -sharp with C-sharp, with Iron Python, with Ruby, with any language that runs on .NET at the moment, there's heaps of them. So you can look into that and try and integrate that with F Sharp. Um, it's functional object oriented, which is actually a trend these days. I've seen OCaml come out about uh, 1996. Uh, Scala's come out, well, it's been around for a little while, but it's only gotten pretty popular pretty recently. And there's languages like Phantom that are coming out, and they're all integrating they're object oriented at the core, but they're integrating functional aspects to make your code cleaner. Um, so F Sharp's largely OCaml compatible. It actually used to, it started off as um, Camel.net, uh, but then uh, it started making some mutations to the language and kind of kind of forked off onto its own language. Um, but a lot of it, a lot of the basic syntax is still OCaml. Uh, so Microsoft has taken the concept from F Sharp, like things like type inference, higher order functions, tuples, all these things, and they're putting it into their other languages. So they're taking all the good things from F-sharp, putting in other things. So if, I think if you stay into F-sharp, if you study F-sharp, you're going to stay ahead of the curve, and you're going to see that um, you're going to know things before they actually get into the mainstream. Uh, great opportunities for parallelism, because uh, you've got immutable data, and data sharing is pretty much the worst thing for parallelism. Uh, and something I like, which is it's white space sensitive, so it looks pretty nice. Uh, I like languages like Python and Haskell. So, who here is a fan of Microsoft? Everyone, right? Yeah, Linux conference, Microsoft. All right. <laughs> um, so it comes with a REPL, um, and it's not a um, it's not one of those REPLs where you can't create classes or anything. It's a full REPL. You can create classes. You can create any, anything that you can do with the compiler, you can do with the REPL. So it's really nice to use. Um, so start off with the actual language. It's multi-paradigm. So on the left here, I've got um, it's object-oriented. So I've just got a little example. So you've got a person, and he can shower, or he can eat something. Um, you can see down in the comments, Roger is showering. Roger is eating lobster. So it's, it's object-oriented like you're probably used to with C Sharp or Java. But then on the right, which is really interesting, is a full quick sort implementation. And I mean, that's only about 10 lines of code. And I think that's beautiful, really. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do that in a, um, just doing that in an object-oriented fashion or even like a procedural fashion. You can't make something that short and make it functional. Um, so type inference. Uh, usually with Java and C Sharp, you have to go like string A equals and put in your string. Uh, with F-sharp, it kind of guesses. It is able to infer 
what what type every variable should be. Well, what what type every binding should be, I should say. So in the first example there, let a equals 10 is able to see that a is an integer, and just and just uses that as the type. It's a strong type, so it has it's not dynamic. It has it resolves the types um, at compilation, but it does that through inference. Um, so we've got a function there. So let f x equals x plus one to string. Uh, that takes an int and gives you a string. So that's the type definition there. Um, and g x equals x. It's got a um, it's got a dash a there. That means it's generic, so it can take any type and give you back that same type. Um, and you can be explicit. So we've got a h function there, which takes an integer and gives you back that same thing. So it's able to infer that if it takes an integer, it gives back an integer. And with the bottom one, it, it's got let i x, and the type is an int. That int is actually um, to that function. So it's able to infer that if it returns an int, and it's only returning the parameter, then it's able to see that the parameter must be an int. Um, so this allows for some succinct code. Uh, list comprehensions. So You've probably seen this in Python, or I guess Ruby's got it. Um, so you're able to just generate lists um, using short syntax. Um, you're able to uh, provide a step in the middle. So I've got two dot dot two dot dot ten. That skips every second one. Uh, and you're able to do it with, with anything. So I've got characters there as well. Uh, and you can do complex. Um, you can run functions inside of the comprehension. So there's a for loop and, um, well, it's a comprehension that gives you back x times x. So it squares each number in that comprehension. Uh, that arrow is shorthand for a yield. Um, yield just um, returns a value and assigns it to that list. Uh, and you can do that yield exclamation mark. So that takes a list and kind of concatenates them all together and gives you back one big list. Uh, and you can kind of map, you can put them all together and you can generate complex um, comprehensions from them. They work for arrays as well. Um, in all these examples, I've got lists, but um, f -sharp supports arrays, so you can do it with arrays or you can do it with lazy sequences. Uh, algebraic data types. Um, most of this talk's going to be about the functional type, the functional parts of f because I'm assuming most of you are going to be into object-oriented programming or something like that. Um, so I'm going to go over the, F, uh, the functional parts. So algebraic data types are pretty big in functional programming. Um, you've got tuples, which take, um, <laughs> which, where the type, sorry, the length is encoded in the type, and the type of every part of a tuple is encoded in the type as well. So an int by a string by a string is different to an int by, str by, int by an int. So you can't actually mix them together, or you can't, it's all encoded in the type anyway. Um, and a record is just pretty much a named type. So I've got, in that tuple, I've got 20 Brian Brisbane. If you, you can use it like that if you know what they mean, but if um, you want to kind of make it explicit what you mean by each of those um, numbers and strings, then you can make a record and say that the age is 20, my name is Brian, and the location is Brisbane. Discriminate unions, so this is kind of a way of making like a single hierarchy. Um, in object oriented, you probably make an employee, you make an abstract class of employee, you make a concrete class of part time, and a concrete class of full time. And they all, um, the part time and full time classes would be, um, would derive from the employee class. Um, with F sharp, we've got discriminate unions, so we can just say that a, um, Part time, oh, saying that a part time is a float and an int, and a full time is an int, and they're both employee types, so you can pass them around and you can pattern match on both, both of those. So it's just a short way of creating a single hierarchy. Uh, we, can, we have enums, uh, they have to be fully qualified, so size.small, size.large, but they just work as an enum. And pattern matching is a big thing in functional programming. So we make a function called print item. It takes either a sum or a none, and that's a type of option. 
So you can either give it a sum of three, or you can give it a none, or you can give it a sum of one, a sum of four, or a none. And it prints out, in this example, it prints out um, what you give it. So we have a three, nothing here. We have a one, we have a four, and so on. Um, higher order functions are um, a big thing in functional programming as well. So we've got a plus function, which is an operator as well. Um, it takes an int, an int, and returns an int. Now we can carry that and say that the first parameter is five and assign that to another function. So add five takes a single, fun uh, takes a single parameter now and gives you back an int. So add five to 10 gives you back 15. Um, so it's a way of kind of um, reducing the amount of par parameters that something takes and um, binding them uh, to, a, to, a, to a name. Uh, this is an example of a closure in an anonymous function. Um, so we have a function called create adder. Uh, the best way to show it is through the uh, add three line. So add three equals create adder three. So what that does is it passes three as x in create adder. Then cr create adder returns a function that takes a y and returns three plus y. So then we can use that add three function, and apply 10 to it, and we get back 13. So it, it, it's enclosed that x parameter inside that new function. We're able to compose functions as well. So for example, you'd probably write um, abs and then bracket x plus 4 um, in something. But we can, get rid of the, um, we can get rid of one of those parameters and just have, it, have composed the two functions together. So we can have, um, we've got a left composition here. so it, does an abs of plus four, and so when you give it negative four, it abses that, and then it pluses four to that. So you get you go from negative four to four, and then to eight. And the same thing with the bottom there, except we're doing with five, and we're doing a right composition. So it does abs first, then it does the plus five to that negative four, and we get back nine. Um, to do mute, to mute, mutate something in F sharp. We've got, to, um, we've got to actually say that it's mutable. So we've, it's got a keyword there. So you say, this binding is mutable. And then you can use this um, backwards arrow to mutate that. In the first example, or in the comments there, I've got let a equals 1, and then I've tried let a equals 2. It can't do that. It, F sharp just doesn't allow that. It's bindings are always immutable, unless you provide the mutable um, keyword. And then I've tried a, I've tried mutating a to make it two. I can't do that unless it's actually unless the mutable keyword is used. Um, so I've made an f function here anyway that takes an x, pluses that to the um, to that a mutable variable, and stores it back into a, and then it prints it out. So that works nicely. But you can't pass mutable variables variables around. They have to um, you can only pass references around. So here I've defined a reference to 100, and there's a special syntax where exclamation mark of the binding means get the value from it, and the colon equals means change, that, change the value of that reference, change what it's pointing to. So you're able to pass references around. The actual reference, the memory that it's pointing to is immutable, but the value that it's pointing, the actual value that it's pointing to is, um, is mutable. So you can mutate that as you want. Units of measure are pretty cool. You can, this is pretty unique to F-sharp. I haven't really seen this in many other languages. So you can annotate something as a measure and you can kind of um, use that in your program to say this is a measure. So we've got a float of M, so that's like saying we've got 10 meters, we've got 80 meters divided by five seconds, so that creates a new type of float meters per second. And we can add to, so we can take, make functions that take those measurements, and it's type safe, so if it, you can't add you know, one second to one meter, it just doesn't make sense, so you know, you, it's all defined by types. 
um, and lazy computations. Um, in this example, I've made a Fibonacci function. Uh, I've also made a time function, so it times any um, lazy computation. So what I've got here is I've got a Fibonacci of 35, so it takes about 521 milliseconds. As you can see, time lazy, but every other time that I've called it, it takes 0 0.001 seconds. So it doesn't actually um, compute when you actually, when I say fib35, it didn't compute because I've got the lazy keyword there. It's when I do l.force up in the time lazy function that it actually gets computed. So the first time it gets computed and then it stores it in that reference and then every other time I want to get it back, it's already there, so it takes 0 0.001 seconds, milliseconds. Uh, there's a tricky subject of monads in here. Um, F sharp supports a special um, like syntactic sugar to allow monadic computing. Um, they call it m computation expressions, which I, I think is pretty smart because um, it kind of gets around that whole monad thing. Um, so to define a monad, you just have to create a new type, give it a um, delay definition, bind definition, and return definition, where delay just takes a, um, a function, um, bind just takes a value in a function, and return takes a value. And they all wrap them up and pass them to the next function in the chain. Uh, you probably won't understand that until this example. Um, so here I've got, um, from the last one, I've got, I'm defining trace equals new trace builder. So I've created a new instance of that. And now I can use trace as a keyword. And I can define, I can use these um, new keywords, let, exclamation mark, and return. And in between each of those lines there, so in between let and return, code is happening. So that's a pretty nice way of you know, running code in between each of your lines, each of your sequence of instructions. So um, down the bottom you can see you start tracing, it's binding to three, it's returning 3.14, and the actual result at the bottom there is 3.14. Uh, this is used in asynchronous workflows. You've probably um, heard about these if you're into F sharp at all. Um, so you can define a, I've got Fibonacci here again, um, you can define that as asynchronous computation, so it's printing it out, printing out the Fibonacci <laughs> sequence. You can run it in parallel and run it, then, then you can do the async dot run synchronously and it'll wait for each of those. And you can see it prints out each one. Uh, code quotations. Uh, you can, down the bottom you can see I've got an at one plus two times three and then another at. That is a, um, that's a quotation of F sharp code. So you can put any F sharp code. I could have put a function call in there. I could have put anything. And then I'll pass that to the to prefix function, which pattern matches on that quotation. So it sees that I've got a specific call to plus. And then it prints, it gives back a string that's, um, that puts it into prefix form. And it keeps um, doing that recursively until I get down the bottom there. Um, I've got a comment that says plus one, and it's put it into prefix form, which is a pretty nice way of transforming your F sharp code into some other language or something. Uh, so I've actually seen quotations be used for um, like uh, database query language. Um, so it actually takes F sharp code, converts it into a query language and passes off to a database layer, which is a pretty nice thing to do. Uh, you can actually extend modules and types. So I've, here I've got um, a module and I'm putting an upper function, uh, upper method onto it and I'm putting a concat map method onto it. Um, and on the string type, I'm putting um, a first character member. So I'll just really quickly, I'll show you this mono develop uh, plugin we've got. So down the bottom, you can see I've got an interactive version of F sharp running. So I can put in a value there, just press control enter, and it will run down the bottom. And it will give you back the type and give you back the value. And it's, um, you can then come down and use um, IntelliSense, and that all works fine in Monodevelop, which is a really nice way of developing programs on Linux. Uh, so to compile your own, you have to use a recent version of Mono. Um, you just compile it like usual. Um, 
get it up, get it from GitHub, um, get F# -sharp from GitHub, and just make install it. Uh, at the moment, F# -sharp's only really seen the code drop kind of fashion, so we can't actually see what F# -sharp has done since they've released it last in November. Um, they're not accepting any patches from us. They're a really small team, so I can kind of understand that. Um, they have to, so that means when F# -sharp releases a new version, we have to go in and merge back in all, the, all those changes. Um, and it's slightly buggy on Mono at the moment. Um, if you download the version from Microsoft, you can actually run it on Linux, and you can run it on Mono, but it's a bit buggy, so I don't recommend that. I recommend using make your own version. And you can help out. Thank you. Right, so it's been good to see people tweeting about the talk during, uh, during the talk. Are there any other questions for Brian? Up here. With the definition of mono that you had an F sharp there, what's the significance of the delay? Sorry, what definition of what? Of monads. Monads, yeah. Uh, significance of delay, that's a good question. Um, it is just passed in at the beginning of um, that workflow execution. So um, you can see it's just start tracing. So it just takes that whole, um, as far as I know, that whole uh, sequence there is a function that gets passed in to delay, and we just run it. Is that? Well, I'm, I'm used to the Haskell version where you only have bind and return to worry about, not delay as well. Yeah, um, I couldn't really tell you why delay is necessary, um, but it is in F sharp. Sorry. Nobody else? Okay, so if there are no more questions, everybody please thank Brian McKenna.